abscess management, physical exam, the key thing you're looking for, you have to be able to palpate some fluctuant. So the big question you come to a lot of times in a primary care setting or an emergency room setting, is the thing ready to be poked or not? A lot of times the skin will be very red, it'll be hard, it'll be indurated when someone gets cellulitis. It's very uncomfortable for the person, but you kind of have to palpate around a little bit and you'll get a sensation. You'll feel like there's some stuff gushing around underneath the skin a little bit. So unless you feel that, there's probably just still cellulitis going on. You usually will tell the person, take hot compresses. That's someone that might be treated with antibiotics. Once an abscess starts to develop, antibiotics will never make this thing go away. The only way to treat this thing is with steel and drain it because the antibiotics can't penetrate this thing very well. If you have a question in your mind, most ERs now or a lot of facilities will have an ultrasound. You can scan it very, very quickly and tell whether there's a fluid pocket or underneath. Sometimes it can be difficult to palpate if it's fluctuant because they can be very deep. If you leave them alone sooner or later, it would probably rupture out to the skin. So sometimes you'll look at the skin and there'll just be a very thin layer of skin. It'll look basically like a big zit and you'll be able to see the pus underneath it. Um, most places will treat this like a sterile procedure. There's probably not a need to do that because the thing's already infected and has all kinds of gross stuff in it. But most places usually, usually what I would do is I would open up a suture kit because it will have everything you need in it depending on your facility except maybe a scalpel or a knife you should call. Don't call a scalpel a scalpel or you won't be cool in your surgery rotation. So the things you'll need are, you'll need a knife to lance it. There's all different kinds of knife blades. The one you usually want to use for this is an 11 blade. So an 11 blade comes to a point. There's other blades that are designed for like skin incisions during surgery. This is, doesn't have the kind of the puncture you need for this. So typically you'd be wanting to find the pointiest thing you can find. There's another blade that has a little bit of a hook on it might be good for that. So you'll need that. You'll need something to anesthetize it with. So we'll pretend like this is full of lidocaine. You want to fill up a big syringe of this. These can, are very difficult to anesthetize because the stuff in there is very acidic and it tends to neutralize this and it, hurt like, it hurts like heck. But so you want to draw, you want a good probably 10 cc of anesthetic because you'll, you might find it's numb, it's not numb, it's numb, you might need to go back and hit it again. And again, you know, you always be very careful once you stick a patient, make sure you, you'll see people, bad habit, they'll stick it back in the bottle, intending to throw the bottle away and then the bottle winds up back on a suture car. So always be very mindful that I would drop a syringe more than you know you need um, and let that be that. You're gonna want something to flush it with. So this has an IV catheter on it, you can flush it with that. This isn't the one ideally you'd wanna use, you'd wanna use something a lot bigger than that. Uh, they also have things called zero wets. If you've ever seen them, they screw on the end of a syringe, it's a little plastic dome, and it lets you produce a jet of fluid without spraying all over, back all over yourself. So you want something to flush it with. So usually the suture tray will have some basins in it. You might wanna pour some betadine in one of the basins and some sterile saline in one of the basins, and that'll be your flush, and that'll be your way to clean it. You need something to break up loculations inside. So in a suture tray, they'll usually be a hemostat. So that's good. You can kind of scoop around on the inside. The, the stuff in here will form little compartments and they'll be like fibrinous gook. And if all those aren't broken down and allowed to drain out, the abscess will just come back right away. And it's good to have some pickups. Those you want to keep sterile till the end usually because those you're going to use to get your packing. So sterile packing strip comes in a bottle. You just want to make sure you don't contaminate the top of the bottle or the end of it. So we'd usually leave that for the end and kind of draw it out with that. And Professor Miller, you have a pair of scissors? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Other thing I forgot because we'll need to cut our packing. So this we would leave to the side. This will be kind of the last thing we'll do. Sterile gloves, they showed you how to put on sterile gloves without mm -hmm. contaminating yourself. So again, it's a sterile procedure. It probably doesn't have to be. This is the kind of thing you clean your hands after instead of before. But we'll put these on as best we can. Before I do that, I'll get a little beta dime. Since this is a one-timer, unlike all our other Sims, we tend not to put betadine on this thing. We can betadine up a little bit because it's just a throwaway, basically. These things hurt. So the patient will hate you when you're cleaning it. They'll hate you when you're numbing it. They'll love you when you poke it and the pressure comes off. They'll hate you again when you're kind of scraping the inside of it out, and they'll love you when it's all done. So this is a big love-hate relationship, but just going to cleanse it as best we can. And in the suture set, there would usually be another field that I would drop on top of here. So we'd have a sterile field established. So I'd use like the fenestrated drape you guys had with the hole in it just to kind of cover everything up really good. And again, when you're cleaning this thing, you can't push down on it really hard because it starts like the devil. Um, in terms of incising this thing, if it's in a cosmetically important area, you have to think about where the skin tension lines are. So if someone has one link in the middle of their forehead, you're not gonna make a big vertical cut through it. You kinda of have to think of which way the skin wrinkles, or if it's on an extremity, usually you're gonna cut kinda of longitudinally. So it's important you plan that out a little bit. 
Um, to numb this thing up, again, these don't get super numb, unfortunately. The places I want to numb are where I'm going to incise it. This is probably not designed to be injected, and this is a much bigger needle than we'd really use, so this might be a little bit of an adventure. I don't know how this will go. But you'd want to numb, so I, I'm going to figure out where I'm going to cut it. I'm going to cut this thing horizontally across the short width. I want to try and numb the track I intend to incise it through. So the patient right now hates me. I'm going to blow that up a little bit. I'll advance the needle from the numb area to the non-numb area. I'll keep advancing it across. I'll keep advancing it across. Oops. I'll keep advancing it across. That usually won't get it too numb. Depending how big the thing is, the other thing you can do is what's called a field block, and that's basically where you go around the outside of it. So maybe a centimeter from the edge of the wound I can numb here. This won't generate a, oh, it will generate a little bit of a wheel. The way you know you're, the anesthesia is going in the right place, the skin should always puff up, so you should form a wheel. Now that that spot's numb, I'm gonna go through the edge of the spot I just numbed into a spot I haven't numbed, and I'm gonna let that wheel up. And then I would go from a spot, so I would go in a circle all the way around the entire wound. One of the few times, one of the few times you're ever going to want to recap a used needles when you're suturing and stuff. I don't want to waste all this anesthetic in case I need to come back and use it. If you ever have to recap a needle, number one, never recap a needle. But if you ever have to recap a needle, make sure you always do a one-handed recap. So put the cap on a surface, stick the needle in the cap. If you do this, you're going to stick yourself sooner or later and give yourself AIDS and Hep C and all kinds of cool things. So you scoop up the cap like that. Make sure the cap is seated properly so I have some anesthetic I can use later. So now to incise this thing. When you're cutting these, there can be a lot of pressure under there. A thing can pop open like a zit and you don't want a face full of this stuff. So depending how big it is and how tense it strikes you, this doesn't strike me as very tense. If it's very tense, put on a gown, put on a surgical mask with a face shield, put a little something between you and this thing. And I send, when I incise them, I usually tend to hold the scalpel upside down to make the initial incision. So I'll poke like that. Usually this will be under pressure and stuff will start gushing out. We'll see what will happen here. And I want to incise probably about two-thirds of the way across this thing. And nothing's coming out, so that's kind of anticlimactic, I guess. <laughs> so maybe they have some simulated loculations in this thing, so we'll see if that happens. So that could actually be the case. Usually when you stick it, pus will start to come out immediately. If pus doesn't come out immediately, it probably means there's little fibrinous gook and walls and things inside. So that's, this is the part the patient really doesn't like. That usually provides a lot of relief. Usually the thing will pop open, the pus will come out, and they'll feel much better. I need to get a hemostat in here, and I need to start kind of doing this to break up anything that might be underneath to get the collections. So I'm just kind of working my way around here. So as you can imagine, they less than love this when you're doing this. I think this thing might be so old the pus just kind of dried out because I see white gook kind of dried in a pool in the bottom. Okay, so just that. Sometimes you'll see people will take a sterile applicator and kind of go around the inside. I just want to make sure I have a sense I'm not running into little obstructions in there. Everything's kind of been broken up. So usually use your needle driver and just kind of gently open it up 360 degrees around the wound. Next thing I would do is irritate the bejesus out of this thing. So a zero it would be better. Failing a zero it, I would get the biggest IV catheter I could find. Just put it in here, cover it up pretty good so I don't make a royal mess and spray myself in the face with it. And this will get kind of, whoops, you can make a royal mess even trying not to. Flush it out really good. If you have a zero at what you would wind up doing is, you can just kind of hold this open with a zero at and flush in here and you'll see chunks of gook come out and busts and all kinds of a mess. Alrighty, so this, I would have a basin with probably 50, 70, 100 cc's of solution, so I'd fill this up and flush it out and fill it up and flush it out and fill it up and flush it out, basically until the water's just kind of a little bit bloody or it looks like it's running clear out of there. So having done that, that's basically our abscess treatment. Now the trick of this thing is if I don't do anything more, there's a pretty good chance this will heal back together like tonight or tomorrow and the abscess will just come right back. So usually if this is of any size, I want to have some kind of strategy for keeping this thing open a little bit so that it could kind of heal, if you remember from, from pathophysiology, secondary intention and all that. What we want to do is the worst case that can happen is if the top seals back together, all the germs are still in there, they're just going to form another abscess. We want this thing to kind of stay open and heal from the bottom to the top by secondary intention. So things you can do to keep this open, if it's in a non-cosmetic area, like if this is on somebody's rear end, 
Sometimes what I would do is, instead of making a straight incision, if I got it numbed up really well, I could make kind of a football-shaped incision that looks like this. So it's a little bit further apart and it's a little bit hard to close. The other thing sometimes people do, sometimes you can actually make a cross incision, so make it look like a plus line, and then get a pair of scissors and cut one of the corners off so you know that corner will always stay open. If it's in some place somebody can see, like on an arm or leg, and you're worried about cosmetics, then you would get into doing some other stuff. So. Open that up for me, would you? So this, I don't want to get all ruin the whole bottle of stuff and contaminate all my packing. So this is sterile, just hold the bottle for a sec. So this is just tape that we will pack in here. You can seal that back up again so that stays sterile. And the only function of this stuff is, you've heard about people getting packing changes, it's just basically, I'm gonna stick it in here and it's gonna help wick out anything else that wants to get in there so as you can appreciate the patient less than loves when you do stuff like this. But this is just to kind of help keep the incision open to help keep wicking out anything that kind of gets stuck in there. And just prevent it from healing closed again because the abscess will want to reform. When you're packing it, you don't want to pack it super tight because that'll prevent it from healing. So you want to pack it loosely, just enough to keep the cavity open. You want to leave about two centimeters sticking out of the person's skin. And it's usually a good idea to kind of tape this down so it doesn't get yanked out before you intend it to when the person's uh, changing their clothes or something like that or showering. Showering soap and water, I usually tell folks they can do whatever they want to this. It's, it's filthy, infected inside, so it's not a big deal. But if they do take a shower, they just have to rinse it very, very well. Uh, the pain and the redness usually starts to go away pretty promptly. Sometimes you'll have an abscess with cellulitis around it. Just a pure abscess, if you have that, you, all you can do is cut it open. The person by the book really doesn't need antibiotics. If they have an abscess with cellulitis around it, usually they'll need antibiotics to cover. Pretty commonly, these will be MRSA things now. So you have to use things like Bactrim to try and cover it. Um, depending how it looks like it's healing, people come in for packing changes, just basically same process. You cut a, stri a sterile strip of packing about the same length, yank this out, see how long it is, cut a sterile strip and repack it, and depending how it looks like it's healing up, you might need to repack it two or three times over the course of a week or ten days, and then usually the edges kind of heal up and you don't have to worry about it healing back together. So that's abscess 101. Any abscess questions? Other things to think about, a person might need a tetanus shot or something like that. If someone has Artificial valves, like heart valves, you worry about endocarditis might be an issue. If someone has artificial joints, so if someone has a hip and a knee replacement, they might need a, a pop of antibiotics before you go and start manipulating this thing because me fiddling with this thing might make them become septicemic a little bit and concede some infection. So those are folks, even if they just purely have an abscess, they might need antibiotic treatment. But if it's just Joe Blow off the street, usually you just cut the thing open and it, it feels much, much better the next day and it heals fairly promptly. Alrighty? Alright, you're on your own.